Can everyone hear me? Sounds like it. Good. So my name is Mark Wilde. I'm another USC homeboy playing on the home turf here. Member of uh, Sequist. Sequist kind of, there was an old TV show called Sequest. It was a really bad TV show, but Sequest is not that. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about two papers. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this first one a little more, how to do quantum convolutional coding with entanglement assisted, and this is work with Todd Brun. And at the very end, I'm going to talk about entanglement distillation protocols, convolutional protocols for entanglement distillation. And this is work with Harry Crovey, former USC student now at NSC Labs, and also Todd Brun. So first, we're going to talk about a classical convolutional code and why you would want to use this. Uh, this technique is very popular in cell phones, wireless communications. Also, a uh, group at JPL is very famous for using this technique, communication with satellites. And so we'd like to take this and apply it to the quantum domain. There are several papers out there, out there which already use this technique, but we've extended it to use entanglement assistance, where the sender and receiver share entanglement. And the most popular technique for decoding convolutional codes also came from another USC homeboy, Viterbi, who gave uh, our school as the Viterbi School of Engineering. Now, a classical convolutional code, this could be a circuit that would take an input stream of data to an output stream. And actually, they usually take uh, one set of inputs to several sets of outputs. And this particular circuit is a finite impulse response circuit. What this means is if your input stream is of finite duration, then what comes out will also be of finite duration. You can see that this will happen. Each of these, so these little dots are copying elements, and these D gates are delay gates. So you, what you do is a linear time invariant filter of your input stream to generate the output stream. Now, if you just have finite duration or finite impulse response circuits, that limits your power of what you can do in the classical domain. So there are also infinite impulse response circuits. And it's assumed in these models that errors will not occur when you're encoding data. And that, that's an assumption that we will make uh, in some of our codes. So that's why I stress that now. An infinite impulse response circuit, a finite duration input stream can lead to an infinite duration output stream. That's why uh, this, is, this filter corresponding to it is called the infinite impulse response filter. And that happens because you're taking the inputs and you are copying them and putting them back into the circuit. And so we use in our circuits, uh, in some of our circuits, infinite impulse response quantum circuits. And uh, we'll discuss some of the issues involved with these circuits later on. So now, just to review, a quantum stabilizer code, a quantum block code, operates in the following way. The, the, the perspective we're taking in this talk is a communications perspective, not necessarily a quantum computing, where we're talking about quantum convolutional codes. But they can be used for quantum computing. So anyway, uh, you start, Alice starts out with some information qubits and some redundant qubits she performs and encoding sends these qubits one at a time over a noisy channel. Bob then performs measurements to diagnose the errors and learns syndromes from the results of these measures, measurements and performs recovery operations. This is the standard model of quantum error correction we're used to. Now a quantum com oh now let me talk about what an entanglement assisted code, how it operates. Todd talked about this in detail in his earlier talk. But we'll just review it here. Alice begins with some set of information qubits, some ancillas, and ebits shared between her and Bob. She then performs a local encoding unitary on her qubits, sends them over the noisy channel. In this process, it's assumed that Bob's half of the ebits don't undergo noise. This is the same assumption used in the proof of entanglement assisted capacity theorems, and we make this assumption uh, when doing entanglement assisted coding. It turns out there are some codes that can correct for errors on Bob's side, but it's not true in general that all entanglement assisted codes 
can correct for errors on Bob's side. So we make this assumption in the operation of these codes. So then Alice sends her qubits over the noisy channel. Bob receives all the qubits, combines them, performs measurements to diagnose the errors, and then performs recovery operations based on those syndromes that he detects from the measurements. Now the big crucial result that came from this work is that you could import an arbitrary classical block code for use in quantum error correction. With the previous picture with stabilizer codes, the CSS construction, you could only import dual containing codes. This allows you to import the full power of the classical coding theory. So this is what we're looking for with the convolutional theory. Now quickly, a quantum convolutional code, uh, several people that have worked on, that have established this area, Olivia and Tillich and Forney and Marcus Grassl and Martin Rettler have worked on this, these codes. How these operate is you divide a qubit stream into uh, frames. And in each frame, you have a set of information qubits and ancilla qubits. And then you perform, Alice performs encoding unitaries that can overlap some of these frames. And so this overlapping unitary gives the code a memory structure. The usefulness of having this convolutional structure is that you can use the same devices, such as a linear optical circuit, or, or that's what we would be looking for, but you can use the same physical devices or the same physical routines to encode these codes. And then Alice sends uh, her qubits after some of them have been decoded, she can send them in an online fashion as they're being encoded online over a noisy channel. And Bob receives them, performs overlapping measurements, and he needs to perform a decoding algorithm such as the Viterbi algorithm to diagnose errors that occur. Now this, all you're doing with this algorithm is you're feeding the syndromes the result from the measurements into the algorithm. It's a purely classical process when you're processing with the Viterbi algorithm. You diagnose which errors occur, which are the most likely to occur, and Bob performs recovery operations based on these uh, syndrome measurements and what the Viterbi algorithm outputs. And then he finally decodes the encoded qubit stream so that the information qubits appear at the receiving end of the channel, and ideally, they're noise free. So that's the way a convolutional code operates. Now what we've done is we've given the convolutional structure the added benefit of entanglement assistance, where the center and receiver share EBITs beforehand in each frame. So what this picture is telling you, the red qubits are Alice's, and the blues are Bob's half of the EBITs. Okay, so since they're spatially separated, Alice's encoding operations can only be on her qubits. And that's why we have this little loop jumping over the circuit because Bob's half of the EBIT doesn't go into it. And you perform the same overlapping encoding structure. Alice sends her half of the qubits over the noisy channel to get affected by noise. Bob's, the blue ones, are immune to the noise from the entanglement assisted assumption. And Bob finally then takes all of the qubits in each frame and performs uh, overlapping measurements, stabilizer measurements to diagnose the errors. And these codes have a stabilizer structure, uh, which we won't really get into that much into, in this talk. And then finally, after Bob has performed recovery operations, he just needs to perform them on the red qubits, Alice's qubits. After doing that, he takes all of the qubits and can decode. Okay, now with some of our codes, the information qubits won't appear in their original spots. So as an example, if I had an information qubit down here, it could appear as the second one in each, or the third one in each frame at the receiving end. So this is some sort of coherent teleportation that's occurring in this process. Now, this, this is an example of an entanglement assisted uh, quantum convolutional code. This one is a, a nice structure in that the operations that we perform on the encoding end are finite depth. 
Now that's sort of an analogy to the finite impulse response in classical circuits. And what it means in the quantum case is if an error occurs over here, it only propagates finitely. If an error occurs on this control qubit, uh, it can only propagate to this target qubit. It, it would be um, a problem in a sense if you were decoding and used infinite depth operations. An infinite depth operation would have the, the source qubit over here and the target, target down there. And so errors could potentially propagate through this circuit, but we're going to show an example of that later on. So anyway, this circuit right here is finite depth. It's an encoding circuit, and the circuit to decode is the exact inverse. You perform these operations uh, in reverse order. Okay, and so those have a very nice structure. And these would be useful for uh, a fault-tolerant quantum computing application. Okay. Now, let's talk about infinite depth operations. These are operations that we introduced because we wanted to be able to import the full classical theory into quantum convolutional coding theory. And we decided that we needed to incorporate these. Okay, and so these are operations you would perform when you're encoding, since we have an assumption that we can do noiseless encoding for some of these codes. Okay, so an infinite depth, depth operation operates as follows. You would have C naught from a qubit in the first frame to the same qubit in the next frame, and so on and so forth. And it's infinite depth because you can trace a path all the way through the circuit. And in terms of the polynomial formalism, you can represent uh, these convolutional codes with Pauli sequences, infinite Pauli sequences. And the resulting operation, if you're looking at a binary polynomial, you would use this side to represent the Z terms and this side to represent the x terms. So an infinite depth operation on the x side would uh, implement this rational polynomial, 1 over 1 plus d, which if you expand it out, would be an infinite sequence of polynomials, 1 plus d plus d squared, et cetera, et cetera. And on the z side, it would only go finitely backwards. So x errors go forward and z errors go, or z entries go backwards. Okay, and isn't it? more complicated example of an infinite depth operation. This circuit right here would implement this polynomial on the x side, which would correspond to an infinite sequence, and this polynomial on the z side. Okay, so we have codes that use these infinite depth operations. Okay, and this is an encoding circuit right here. You have these finite depth operations. You perform Alice performs then this infinite depth operation and finally performs more finite depth operations. They're encoded. She sends her half of the qubits over a noisy channel. And then at this point, you would perform, Bob would perform, would take all the qubits, perform stabilizer measurements, get classical data from that, classical syndromes, run a decoding algorithm, such as the Viterbi algorithm, correct the errors, and then perform this decoding circuit. Okay, now it's important that the decoding circuit have finite depth operations only. Because if you had infinite depth operations, the errors that occurred over the channel that's supposed to be here would propagate infinitely. So if there are errors that you can't correct for over here, they would propagate infinitely through the stream and thus we call it a catastrophic error. Okay, and when we include infinite depth operations on Alice's side, it turns out we needed to incorporate decoding operations with Bob cub Bob's qubits also, so we could properly decode the qubit stream. And we have several classes of entanglement assisted quantum convolutional codes, and we divided them up based on how we could encode them and decode them. Okay, so the first class are the ones that are the most practical, most useful for quantum computation even, because we don't have to make any assumptions about encoding and decoding. All these operations are finite depth. The second class uses, the second class, the example I just showed you falls into the second class, and that class uses both finite depth and infinite depth operations on the encoding circuit, and finite depth decoding operations. Okay, so these, would be more practical for a quantum communication scenario. And finally, this is the last class, and 
We included infinite depth operations on in the decoding circuit, and I realize I said that I couldn't do that before, but the assumption we made is these infinite depth operations only happen on Bob's half of the EBITs. And in the entanglement assisted communication paradigm, you assume that those are noiseless. So we said, okay, we'll go ahead and do these, even though we really would prefer not to. And there are several advantages uh, which are similar to what Todd and Igor and Mincio found for entanglement assisted block codes in that we could import two arbitrary classical codes. Okay, this is a very simple picture of what's going on. It's a CSS-like construction. This is a parity check matrix for a classical convolutional code. In general, it's a, a matrix of polynomial entries. And this is another classical binary convolutional code. You take them with the CSS recipe, and this is really just showing you Alice's side. There's a lot of steps we have to go through to get to, uh, to determine the encoding circuit and the decoding circuit. But in general, you're gonna have uh, entries for Bob's half of the EBITs, and I haven't shown these here. But if you read the preprint, you'll see all that there. And the result is that the rates and error correcting properties of the classical codes that you import will translate to the quantum case. Okay, so high performance classical codes will yield high performance quantum codes. And in general, if your classical code H1 encodes K1 information, information bits into N information, into N physical bits. And the second code encodes K2 information bits into N physical bits per frame. Then this will yield a, an entanglement assisted quantum convolutional code with these parameters. And this parameter C is the, the number of E bits that the code requires per frame. And there's a specific formula we give that depends on H1 and H2 in the paper. It has to do with the rank of H1 times H2. It's a little more complicated than that, but. Okay, and, and lastly, which, one minute, okay. Very quickly, an entanglement distillation protocol, uh, you can take a stabilizer code. This is a textbook problem in, in Mike and Ike, uh, chapter 12. You take a stabilizer code, you perform the measurements corresponding to it, and you can produce an entanglement distillation protocol. Okay, that's well known. And in this other paper with Hari and Todd, we gave entanglement distillation protocols a, a convolutional structure. Okay, and we found the same result. This is the operation of entanglement distillation protocol. We found the same result. You could import classical convolutional codes for use in entanglement distillation. And in that construction, for decoding, you essentially get logical, uh, you get sort of information EBITs from physical EBITs. In that construction, our decoding circuits were only finite depth, so that was nice. And so as a, in conclusion, uh, these entanglement assisted codes are nice because they, they're nice to physicists because they exploit entanglement in the procedure. And importing classical codes should produce high performance quantum codes. The last thing we'd like to connect this to because of the connections between quantum privacy and, and distillation is figuring out how to uh, use these codes in quantum key distribution. It may be more practical uh, use of these procedures. And of course, there's much to explore. Thank you very much. shown in the example, they, they don't. Because uh, if, if you have a path where a source qubit is, uh, the one, the gate operating before it is connected to a target qubit, then it has the infinite depth structure. In that example, it may not have been clear, the, the circles and the dots may have been small, but there was that structure there. For those gates, it was, Right, so it's sort of a shorthand that, it's all C-naughts, it's a shorthand that Gressel and Rutler employed. You really should, 
uh, expand it to make it more clear, but to, so. Okay, so I think 